It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 101, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Curtis Millsap. Curtis raises two acres of vegetables with about 22,000 square feet under plastic at Millsap Farms, just outside of Springfield, Missouri. He and his wife, Sarah, make a living from the farm with the help of their 10 kids, a full-time farm manager, and one other employee. Curtis shares how his farm grew over the years and then how it shrunk on its path to profitability and a more family and faith focused life, shedding most of its livestock and farmers markets in favor of production that they can really stay on top of and the addition of a major value added enterprise with their pizza club. We dig into the pizza club and why they've structured it as a membership program and how that works on a farm that's wired for community. Curtis shares how they have leveraged seconds and family labor, including Sarah's skills as a pizza magician to grow the enterprise and make it work. Curtis also lets us in on how they've created a farm that allowed them to take five full weeks of vacation last year. We talk about the routines and management systems they built to support Curtis's quality of life goals, including the fundamentals of Curtis's paper-based system to stay on top of tasks and projects. He also shares the good and the bad about the Chinese-style solar greenhouse that they built. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop-growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com and by Farmers Web, making it simple for farms to work with wholesale buyers, such as restaurants, retail stores, and schools. Farmers Web software streamlines your wholesale operations, making it easier to work with your buyers and with more buyers overall. FarmersWeb.com. Curtis Millsap, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks, Chris. It's good to be here. I'm really honored to be here. I, I love the Farmer to Farmer podcast. It's been uh, the last couple of years since you started. It's been one of the high points of my week is when it comes out and I've learned so much from listening to other farmers talk about what's, uh, what works on their farm and what doesn't. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much, Curtis. It's, I, you know, the honor goes both ways because this, this show doesn't work without people like you willing to give up an hour and a half of their day, you know, which isn't something that comes cheap when you're a vegetable farmer to basically lay out what you do on your farm for all of your competitors to copy. So, um, you know, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. You bet. Although I think Walmart's probably our competitors. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think the rest of us as cooperators. There you yeah, go. I, right. I, yeah. I, you know, it is, it's always funny. I think in the organic farming world, it's competitors in a very loose sense and, and not in a way yeah. that, that any traditional business would consider it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Curtis, I'd like to start off today by, having you kind of put Millsap Farm in context, where are you guys located and what are you doing? Okay, so we're in Springfield, Missouri, which is the southwest corner of Missouri. Uh, it's a pretty big metropolitan area, about 400,000 people. And so that's our market. Um, we have 20 acres of, veg- of uh, farm. And of that, we only cultivate about two acres. So we grow about two acres of vegetables. And um, on that two acres, we have actually, uh, up until last year, we had about 12,000 square feet under cover. And then this year, we really bumped up and we added another eight, almost 10,000 square feet. So we're at about 22,000 square feet under plastic nowadays between uh, big greenhouses. We've got a Chinese greenhouse. We've got a couple of high tunnels and we've got a bunch of caterpillar tunnels now as well. Uh, so we really have invested heavily in that. Uh, we do uh, 150 member summer CSA. We do about a 70-member winter CSA, which my farm manager keeps telling me, are you sure we do 70 winter members? But we do. Uh, so far, we do it well. Um, and that's kind of – both of those numbers have grown gradually over the last uh, nine years, which is how long we've been doing CSA. Uh, we bought the farm about almost 10 years ago and then uh, started farming full-time the following year. So I have been a full-time farmer for nine years, and uh, during that time, we've had uh, – grown from, I think originally we had 25 CSA members and just kind of gradually ramped that up. We do farmer's markets as well. Uh, at one time we were doing up to five or six farmer's markets a week and we're down to just one now. And uh, it's a good market. Uh, it's a farmer's market of the Ozarks. It's a covered pavilion. Uh, so it's a year round market. And in fact, my wife's getting ready right now to go to market. She'll, she'll be there for a special holiday market this afternoon. So, uh, so we do, and then, and then we also have uh, some restaurant sales. 
Uh, that's not a real big thing, but it's a growing thing for us, and we really like it. It's it's a neat way to move produce, and really for us, that's uh, it's kind of the third leg of sales, which we like. We like having three kind of marketing outlets, and uh, then we also have a, a pizza club on the farm, and we have about 250 people out to the farm uh, every Thursday from May to October for pizza, wood-fired pizza. We've got two big wood-fired ovens that we built on the farm. And uh, we, we make all the, most of the toppings and ingredients ourselves. And uh, we have live music and it's, uh, it's really a big party once a week. So, uh, so those kind of the, that's the, the, the uh, marketing end of things and kind of the production end. Now, staff wise, we have, um, I've got a full-time farm manager, uh, Kim B, who's been here for four years now. And I've got a uh, farm hand who's also been here four years, uh, Cammie. And both of them uh, are amazing resources, as you can imagine, to have people with that sort of longevity on the farm. And then I've also got uh, 10 kids. And my, one, my oldest is out of the house, has been out of the house for quite a while. But my, my next ones down are all fairly, fairly young, 13 and down. And I've got eight girls and one boy in that group. So I have a lot of small kids and, and young ladies around the house. So it's, they're also a lot of help on the farm. And, of course, in pizza night, they're just amazing help. So. That kind of gives you a snapshot of where we are. We, uh, the Ozarks, you know, zone wise, I think we're considered like seven, si- between six and seven. It's one of those weird zones. Uh, but we get cold. So we get down to, I mean, for us, cold is like negative 10 or so. We get that about every other year. And then we get hot. We get hot in the summer and we stay hot. We're not, we're not like South Arkansas hot. We're, you know, but we'll get a couple weeks usually where it breaks uh, high 90s or 100 for, consistently and pretty much the month of July and August, it's going to be hot. And if it drops below 60, it feels like a really cool night. So most nights are, you know, stay pretty warm. So. What is it about the Ozarks? You know, it, it's kind of funny. We've had a number of guests on the show from that Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri area. There seems to be a lot going on there. You know, it's interesting that you say that because that what I hear about people like out in upstate New York or, uh, you know, even upper Midwest, I think, boy, they have a lot going on up there. So maybe that's perception. Uh, we're pretty scattered around here, but there are some really innovative growers. And maybe part of that is because we, I mean, I know everybody feels like they have a challenging environment. And so I, we probably all do, but we certainly feel it here. I mean, it, we like this week, in fact, we were, you know, we were talking a little before the show, but it's it's swinging this week from uh, so last Sunday it was negative one, uh, this Sunday it's supposed to be 62. You know, it's not going to freeze at night for the next four nights, and before that it was you know dad, this last night it was a uh, low of 22 or so. So it's really a challenging um, environment from a temperature swing perspective. We also have really high humidity, and then we do we're on the edge of the plains here. I mean we're on the Ozark Plateau. We're, we've got really neat rolling hills and a lot of forest and stuff, but we've still got, um, we're still connected to the plains pretty close by. So we've got some high winds. I mean, it's not uncommon for us to have 40 mile an hour winds. And then uh, several times a year, we'll have 50 plus mile an hour winds. And so uh, those, you know, all those things add up to a pretty challenging growing environment. So I think, I think the people who've stuck with it are pretty innovative and, you know, kind of think outside of the typical, uh, uh, the typical model, uh, or at least half, you know, like Patrice is a great example. Patrice Gross uh, is a good friend, does no-till down there in uh, Eureka Springs, and you had him on a little while back. And Patrice is just an inspiration because he's one of these guys who started with the, kind of the homestead model and then went, uh, but I want to do this commercially. And then he said, but but I really want to respect the soil. I really want to make this work, you know. And so, but he's done this uh, in part as a response to the climate that we're in here, where it gets really hot, it gets really cold, and you got to have soil that supports your plants no matter what's going on, and then some infrastructure too. So uh, I think he's a good example. Mark Kane is the same way. Uh, but, you know, those of us who are around here who are, who are making a living doing it, you got to be pretty resilient in the Ozarks. You can't, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty – it's a, a lot of swinging from, from highs to lows and, and humidity stuff. So. And you said making a living. So you are making a living at this. I want to I back up a little bit because you've got – You've got two acres of vegetable production, you you know, a half acre undercover. You've got, but then you're supporting, you know, it sounds like two full-time employees at least, and then uh, 10 kids and you and and your wife, Sarah, all 
on the this farm. That's that's a lot from a little. Absolutely. Yeah, we uh that's a good theme actually for us is a lot from a little. Um so you know, uh, my, my wife and I, my wife Sarah and I, when we started this uh, nine years ago, uh, we really started from more of a kind of a, a vision of community uh, more than really wanting to be uh, uh, agricultural producers, I guess. I mean, we wanted to farm, but our but kind of the motivation behind that was community. And I really think that stems out of our faith. I mean, we've, we both grew up in, in Christian church and then we kind of both have, uh, you know, grown over as adults into that, into sort of a more full understanding of what that means to us. And one of the things that it really means to us is living in community and supporting the community around us, caring for the people around us. I mean, you know, I, I think, I think the Bible really means it when it says love others as yourself. You know, I, I think that's a real thing. And so we, um, we really wanted that to be who we were, what we were about. And so the initial part of that was uh, in, in adoption. So the reason we have 10 kids or part of the reason we have 10 kids is because we have five biological and five adopted. And, um, and so when we got married, that was a big part of what we wanted to do in the first place was to reach out to kids that are in you know, tough places and bring them into our home. And, uh, and we both really love the outdoors. And we thought originally it would be kind of a sort of a, uh, we'd work at a camp or a ranch or something like that, that, you know, was a sort of a youth program. We really didn't picture ourselves as, as, uh, independent farmers necessarily, but as we kind of grew, uh, as a couple and, and as, as, uh, we did some teaching out in New Mexico, we worked in Colorado for a little while. And, and as we were doing these things, we thought, you know, we really just want to be out on the land. And I mean, we'll do however that works out best, that's going to be the best direction for us to go. So when we moved back to the Ozarks, as we were expecting our first uh, biological daughter, and uh, we're looking for what was next, I did some construction for a couple of years, but we eventually bought this piece of land with the idea that it had enough space for us to include other families and other, uh, and by families, I include, you know, single people and whatever, but, but there would be other uh, people connected to us through this piece of land. And it's really worked out that way. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I, I really feel like that's partly a reflection of our faith and our moving forward in that. I also think that it's partly a reflection of creating an environment that uh, is healthy for everybody. You know, I mean, and, and by healthy, I don't mean, uh, you know, not that we don't all work hard and that we don't uh, sometimes have squabbles and whatever, but, but that we respect one another and love one another enough to, to make all that work. And so then that ties in financially too. You know, I think when you extend that, so I kind of think of our community as this little core here on the farm with uh, basically we've got uh, my farm manager and her family live here on the farm. My farm hand has been living on the farm here for four years. My wife and I and our kids live in, in the house. And um, then at different times, we've had other families living here, either interning with us or apprenticing with us, or we've had uh, you know several young folks who came to us maybe through woofing or whatever and ended up staying for six months or a year or more. And uh, those kind of connections, I feel like, uh, are really core to who we are. And then as you look beyond that, you know, and then we've got community supported agriculture. Uh, those people, uh, we know those people pretty well. You know, they're families that, that we've connected with over the years. And so we know when they're expecting babies. We know uh, what's going on in their lives. And we've been to a couple of funerals. Uh, it's, it really becomes uh, an extension of our farm and our family. And then the bigger community, you know, people who come to pizza night, uh, which is at this day point, I think we've got like a, you know, 3000 member uh, email list for that event. So there's a lot of people involved in that. And, and we reach out to the larger community that way. because we have school tours and, and uh, uh, groups that from the local university that come out and work with us or, or volunteer in, in exchange for some class time experience. And then, uh, then farmers market as well. And so that whole thing was a, for us initially, I mean, the, our, our motivation and all of that was about creating community. And so, uh, so the financial thing, which, sorry, that was a long way around to the money question, but, but the money question is there, right? I mean, it's, uh, you can have all these good feelings and how do we actually make this work financially? And that is that, uh, we have found ways to interface with that community that generate enough income that it works out. So, uh, and then, you know, initially uh, in those first few years, I did do some off-farm work as well. 
but I haven't had to work off farm in the last, I think about six years now, five or six years. And, um, and we have gradually grown our income over time. Uh, but you know, nowadays we're bringing in the gross, uh, this, I don't know what it is quite this year, but last year it was about, uh, 260, maybe it's 200, closer to $270,000, uh, gross. And that meant that my family actually netted about 36,000 or so. And so that's not a lot, you know, for a family of, of, uh, 11 in the home. But we also grow a tremendous amount of our own food. And, you know, being a farm, there's a lot of things that we have that are, are partially written off on the farm, uh, on the farm end of things. And uh, so it's enough. It is, I will tell you that like four or five years ago, I went to the accountant, you know, in February. And, uh, and of course, going to the accountant for me is always usually a pretty good thing because with nine kids, you pretty much know you're going to walk away with a, a pretty big <laughs> refund check, and that's, which is kind of fun, you know. And so, so we're going through this, and uh, you know, I bring out all of my receipts, and we balance things out. And this is this is kind of I'm kind of a shoebox receipt keeper. It's not I'm not a great organizer, unfortunately, for bookkeeping. But I get to the end of all these all these um, um, write offs and things, and she looks at the number in the end and, and she looks at me and this is, this is classic Ozarks too. She goes, honey, are y'all doing all right? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I, I don't see how you're making it. <laughs> I was like, well, we're doing okay. I don't know either. I mean, I see the numbers in front of me and I also agree that it looks really skimpy for what we're doing uh, for, you know, how many kids we have, but you know, we took a vacation. We've, we've had, you know, we got a working car. We all well-dressed and fed and housed and so on. So I guess it's working. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a long answer. Yes. I also pay uh, you know, a couple of salaries. They're small salaries. Uh, it also includes room and board, which helps. Uh, again, that's kind of one of those things I can kind of offset with an in-kind uh, thing. And, and one of the things we learned on our farm early on was any way that we can kind of uh, keep expenses inward. So, you know, by providing housing instead of paying somebody enough to house themselves somewhere else, then that, to me, that's a benefit to the farm. Um, and I know that all, not all people can uh, view it that way, but, you know, with our, with our kind of community centeredness, then that, that works pretty well for us. Uh, but yeah, they, everybody seems to be pretty happy. You know, they stick around for multiple years and each year we're able to give them a raise. Uh, Actually, one of your guests, uh, uh, Steve Pincus, uh, TP Produce, was uh, and that boy. That's been a while now, maybe almost that's, two years ago, I guess. Wasn't yeah, it? he was one of my but very he, early, uh, very early interviews. Yeah. Well, listening to Steve talk, man, that was just inspirational because here's a guy who has done community on his farm for a long time with his workers and really uh, seems to have it have a great handle on it. And so, listening to him talk was inspirational, but. One of the things it did was it inspired me to give everybody a big raise. I was like, well, you know, we got to make this, we got, we got to keep this thing equitable. And so uh, it's not like any of us are getting rich, but we all seem to be doing okay. So, yeah. You mentioned that even with all this stuff going on, you guys are still managing to take vacations. Yeah. So uh, last year, we took about five weeks of vacation. We went uh, to Colorado for a week and a half in the summer. We went to, uh, Arkansas for a week in the winter. We went to actually my wife and I went to Belize last January. Uh, we went to uh, the nor the northeast. Well, I mean to us northeast uh, Washington, and uh, went to Colonial Williamsburg for about almost two weeks last fall. Uh, so yeah, we really get out a lot. And part of that is I have found that if I don't leave the farm, then I don't stop farming. You know, it's hard to walk away from it. You got to put boundaries around it, and so. Um, as long as I'm here, I'll find myself drifting back toward tending things. Um, but the reality is, you know, I, I, um, when I walk away, then I, I anymore, I've got a, a staff that I walk away and I just don't worry about it. I really find myself, you know, for days at a time going, eh, I'm not, I'm just not thinking about it. I'm not worried about it. If they have a problem, they'll call me, but they're experienced enough and, um, and intelligent and resourceful enough that I really just don't worry about it. So it sounds like rather than limiting, you know, your work hours on a daily basis that where you're really choosing to find that, that quality of life balance point is, is in terms of getting off the farm for extended periods of time. Yeah. You know, the way that we have uh, found balance on the farm, I should, I should probably step back and tell you a story about this because it'll help illustrate kind of where, you know, where we've come from. Um, uh, 
and I, and I want to, one thing I want to say is that I hope that nobody, you know, listens to us talk about five weeks of vacation and feels bad about themselves. Like <laughs> That's certainly not the point, right? Um, it's more about this, this can be done. This is, you know, hopefully people look at this and go, this is, I can do this. This is good. I, this is a, this is something to aspire to. And that's kind of the way we were. It obviously didn't start that way. You know, we had, uh, like everybody, we had our startup phase and we had three years there where we just, it was nose to the grindstone. And if we got to take a week away, it was a big deal. Um, and, and so I started, uh, farming originally, we started with, uh, kind of a Salatin type model in our head. And so that's what we'd read. And that was interesting to us, you know, pul- pastured poultry and so on. So we did pastured poultry. We had, uh, and then alongside that, we also did the vegetable CSA with about 25 members or so and the farmer's market. And, uh, that was the first couple of years were the years we were doing like five farmer's markets at a time. And, uh, and you interviewed my sister-in-law a while back, but she was out on the farm some at that point too. She was a man, helped manage the greenhouse for a year, and we were doing uh, some plant sales through that. She was doing uh, potted, uh, what do you call those, starter plants? You know, yep. uh, yeah, right. So a lot of flowers and stuff. And so we were just, I mean, we were burning the candle at both ends. And and I think, you know, to be fair, I think that's what startup is. I, I don't think anybody gets to start something up without having a real intense period, uh, and that was us. And so we started out, we had about, uh, the first year, I think we had a little less than an acre in vegetables. And then we had, oh, about uh, 500 uh, meat meat birds and uh, another couple hundred layers. And then we had, uh, the next year, we added some goats and we added some turkeys. And man, we peaked out uh, about four years in, three years in, I guess it was, as far as overall work. We got up to seven acres of vegetables and uh, about uh, that summer we did, I think, 1,200 meat birds and 400 turkeys and about 800 laying hens. And we had about 40 goats, which, by the way, is 40 too many goats, no matter what else you're doing in your life. And we had uh, we had about 30 hogs or so. I mean, it was, it was a – well, okay, so from one perspective, when people would come visit, they'd be like, wow – you guys are such a cool, diverse, organic farm, right? Right, right. And then, but from the inside, it felt like this, uh, like like juggling too many flaming balls all at once. You know, you knew this cannot go on. You can't do this for long. And um, and it took me a while to realize that. You know, I had uh, I, I burned out a lot of good health in the process. And but really, there was one kind of moment that was really an epiphany and. The, the year before that, so this was three years in was the year we kind of peaked out at the seven acres, which was, by the way, a classic example of, you know, we, we did well with one acre. We did pretty well with two acres. And we were like, hey, if we go up to seven acres, we'll make a lot more money. <laughs> we, 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 obviously, that doesn't work that way. And it's one of, and it's one of those lessons you usually have to learn, you know, with a two by four oh. to the head kind of a thing. It's it's a yeah. I, I mean, I we did that on my farm with, you know, I mean, particularly with the chickens and the pigs. Yeah. Yeah. Which are fun. You know, I mean, livestock's cool and whatever, but, but for me, so year, year three was kind of the year we went, I went, I don't think I'm actually a livestock guy. It turns out. So, so here's what I realized over time, you know, I've kind of been able to put it in words over the years, but, uh, I'm, I'm not a check twice a day kind of guy. And, you know, that's really what poultry needs, right? You can't walk away from a pen of pastured poultry and, and not check on it later that day. I'm really more like a check on it every other day kind of guy. And that didn't work out well for pigs or poultry or anything else, you know, other than carrots. Right. And I, I realized carrots don't care. You know, tomatoes are all right with that. I mean, if you've got good watering systems and you got, uh, you, you trellis properly and so on, you can walk away from those for two days and be okay. Uh, you can't do that with animals. So that was, so year three was that kind of revelation. Like, okay, I'm, I'm apparently not really wired up for animals. And, um, and if I had to give something up at that point, uh, we were having a lot of predator loss with our animals, uh, with our uh, with our poultry. And so it was an obvious thing. It was like, okay, well, this is we'll, we'll give up animals. We'll just stop doing livestock next year. And we, but we kept the seven acres of vegetables. And now in doing that, and this was borrowing neighbors' land. It was a really nice piece of land, but you know, it was a, it was not our land. And um, in doing that, I thought, well, we'll get it. We'll be able to get a handle on that then, right? We'll, you know, cut our labor. I mean, our, our labor needs basically in half, and that was somewhat true. I mean, it certainly was a better year than the year before when we when we just did the vegetables, focused on that. 
uh, our actual our income stayed about the same, which was interesting too. But uh, but what happened really was that um, uh, I still had way too much to do, and we never fully mechanized. So we were in that weird you know dead zone that people talk about. And of course, I'd read about it; I knew it existed, but you know everybody believes they're going to beat it on their own, right? So yeah, I had you know larger than two acres, smaller than ten acres. It's a really weird. It's hard to mechanize fully enough to really take advantages of economies of scale. You know, you go to 10 to 200 acres, and now you've got machines that can do these things, and, and you can do I mean, I've got friends who do 80 acres with, like, three or four folks, you know, but, but they're totally mechanized. And on the other end, you know, here's us with three of us full-time plus a lot of interns and apprentices and things coming in and out at different times, and we're just, you know, we, we feel like we're really busy with two acres. So, so we were at this seven-acre weird zone. And, uh, and this was my epiphany moment. And this was really a, this is really the, the moment where it all kind of congealed in my head. I was out late at night in August. I'm out there tilling in the dark. I think it was like nine o'clock at night. And, uh, I'm tilling because there's like a 30% chance of rain this night, you know, and I'm trying to get some carrot seeds in the ground. So I'm tilling weeds under to plant carrot seeds. Now, I mean, there's so many things wrong with this picture, right? <laughs> yes. And but, yeah, and, and, and not to mention and, the and fact that the reason I'm doing it is because I'm hoping it'll rain, you know, because I don't have enough irrigation to even properly irrigate carrot seedlings in, in August. Why would you bother, right? I mean, there's no point in being out there. But I didn't, you know, you're in that mindset. This is what I do. I'm a seven acre vegetable farmer. I've got ego tied up in this thing. I've got this idea of who I am. I've got uh, I've got people who are depending on me, by golly, and I'm going to make it happen. And uh, so I'm out there tilling, and it's dark, and I'm I'm uh, thinking. And really, honestly, Chris, it was like it was like the finger of God just came out of the sky and pointed at me and said, "Hey, stupid, what are you doing on the tractor?" <laughs> you know, and uh, and I'm I, I'm like well, I'm trying to plant carrots, you know. And, like, no, you know, there are at this time, five little girls in the house who want a bedtime story. And you're out here on the stupid tractor. You know, it's re- are they really going to care in 10 years, whether you grew carrots in the fall of 2000, whatever? Yeah, I mean, is that going to matter? Is anybody going to look back and go, boy, aren't you glad that Farmer Curtis was so good at raising carrots that, you know, yeah, of course I wasn't either. I mean, that was the other thing I was doing it poorly, even at that. But I, but I had this impression that by working harder and bigger, I was going to somehow succeed. And, uh, and it was a big reset button. It was a big epiphany moment. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, it was a moment of repentance, truly. And by repentance, I mean turning around, backing away, going, I got to stop this. You know, this is not working. This is going to end badly, right? Um, and so I, I did. Um, I finished out the season, of course. I felt like I really, you know, I needed to to try and honor my commitments to my CSA members. And so I did finish out that season, but I said, next year, we're going to cut back to three acres. And that was 2012 was the year that we cut back. And, uh, and three acres, I thought I could kind of eke out three acres of cropland on my farm. And so that was, but I, I just couldn't see us getting smaller than three acres. I thought, well, that's, that's kind of as small as we can get. But 2012, you remember is that horrible drought. I mean, we haven't had a drought like it in, in decades. And, uh, by May, I was planted to two acres and it was all I could do to keep it watered. And I mean, this is the Ozark. So we're already getting, and this was, this was an extremely hot year. We didn't have a frost, a significant frost after February of that, after the middle of February of that year, I could have planted tomatoes the first of March. I mean, that's the kind of weird year it was. And uh, as opposed to normally, you know, first of May. So we were two months ahead of schedule. So by May we were in the nineties. It's dry. It's hot. It stopped raining. It didn't rain again until September. And, uh, I just said, you know, I'm at two acres. If I do anything more, then for the rest of the season, I'm going to be playing triage and, um, you know, deciding which crops are going to die because I don't water them. And nobody likes that. That's a horrible way to farm. You know, to, the defeatist, it's, like, it's, it's just such a bad feeling to know that you are not doing your job well and that you're going to, you know, things are going to be sacrificed for that. And so that's when we stopped at two acres. And, you know, that year we had a better net and a better gross than we'd ever had before. Uh, and that's, you know, to me, that speaks of the right amount of resources, both people, water, land, fertility, uh, machinery, all that applied to uh, the right purpose, 
you know, and now we, we understood better what we were doing. I had reset my priorities. I was saying, okay, remember this was about community. This was about family. This was about, uh, serving these people, uh, that are around me and loving and caring for them, uh, sharing the light of God with them. And I, it's not about how many stinking carrots you grow. It's not a contest, you know? Uh, but it took a lot of ego. I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, ego dying for that to work. You know, I guess I was, I was attached to this idea of, hey, we grow seven acres of vegetables and we do poultry and we do goats and we do pigs and we do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So since then, we've, we've been very disciplined. Yeah. It's so much easier, I think, to measure, you know, acres and dollars of sales and, and, you know, row feet of carrots than it is to measure the fuzzy stuff. Like, you know, I, I read, you know, I read four stories to my girls last week, you know? That's and and exactly. nobody nobody yeah. brags about that stuff. Right? You don't you don't get to go to a farmers conference where people say, well, so well, and even me, right? I didn't I didn't say so. Tell me about your family life. I asked you tell tell me about your farm. Sure, which is fair. It's a farming show, right? So, yeah, but but yeah, it it is about it is. I mean, everybody talks about farming and recognizes it's a lifestyle, but I don't know that there's enough talk about then what does that really mean for us as farmers. I mean, I'm sure you've known plenty of them. I've known a lot of farmers who burned out after a few years. You know, a lot of these young, excited, like myself, you know, young, excited people. Had I, had, had I not had that epiphany in the field, I don't know where I'd be now, but I don't think I would be uh, at a point where I could, you know, relax in my home and have a conversation with you about what a great family life I get to have with my, these wonderful children and wife and uh, this community around me, you know, I, I would be in a very different position because I was burning through things pretty fast back then. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it is a conversation the farming community has to have if we're going to uh, get past the sort of uh, macho ego. Maybe it's not even macho. It's just an ego thing of like, this is what we do. This is who we are. We work harder than anybody else. I mean, that's true whether you have a high quality of life or not, right? right. I mean, the farmers just work hard. It's just the nature of the beast. You can't do this and and be, uh, you know, you can't do this from a recliner. You can't do this from your office chair necessarily. So um, so it's it's important uh, that we have these conversations. And, and I think uh, one of the, I've seen some really cool programs where, uh, where farm beginning folks are partnered up with farm mentors. And there are some of those now that are starting to include sort of a social work aspect of how do we teach farmers to have a more balanced life. I think that's really important. I'm, I, I like to see that. And certainly when I, when I meet young farmers, to me, when I talk to them about best practices, when I talk to them about uh, using covered space or irrigation or any of that, I, I want it all to be within the context of because this will help you achieve your real priorities in life. It's not because it'll grow bigger, better carrots. I mean, that's just a symptom of doing things the right way. But, uh, but really, the bigger issue is, can you meet your life goals that you set out in front of you when you started out the farm? Because, you know, nobody, far, nobody sets out the farm to be able to have bragging rights as to how many, how many tomatoes they pick this summer. Everybody starts out farming. All the people I've known start out with farming because they really are passionate about it. They want to be involved in this really cool thing that happens when you interact with soil and seeds and water. And it's, it's amazing, right? I mean, it's, it is a creative act that there's hardly anything that compares to it in the world. But it also can become this absolutely uh, life-stealing um, vortex of emotional and um, soul-killing you know, time sucking, all this stuff. I mean, how many of us have known families that were sacrificed on the altar of the farm? And so I'm, that's, that's my hope is that like people will, will grab a hold of this and say, okay, there is a way to do this. Obviously there's not a one size fits all um, for us. You know, it's, it's meant this very small uh, intensive production with a community farm, with pizza night and so on. I also know people who do this really well and have huge farms you know, so it's not it's not a scale thing, really. But it, I think what it is, is mostly, at least for us, it's been about recognizing what's really important in our lives and then making sure that those things stay at the front. And it's not, I mean, it is certainly not a one-time decision. I mean, I talk about that epiphany moment, and that was a big deal. And, it, and it's still a moment that I go back to. Um, you know, the, the definition of faith is that uh, it's not actually what we sometimes think. We sometimes think it's like trying to believe something that we don't really believe. The definition of faith is remembering 
and choosing to believe what you knew to be true, even in times when it doesn't, when, it, when there are is doubt, you know, when there's, when there's times when it seems like, so for example, I think on my farm, um, one of my, one of the ways I exercise my faith is by remembering when it seems like the most important thing that I need to get done right now is to make sure I get that extra row of whatever's in is to remember that, um, if that is in direct conflict with this thing that I really do know, you know, when I really step back far enough, I really do know that it's much more important that I raise my daughters and my sons to be wonderful people and, uh, you know, adults that commu- connect and communicate with the world and, and contribute and love people. Uh, then I go, okay, that, that reminds me, I think I'll let these carrots slide today. I think I'll go inside and have dinner with my family. And so that's, that's to me what a large part of what faith is about is that kind of constant remembering of the, the real truth. And uh, that's a challenge, right? I mean, it, it's a challenge for me every day. Uh, I don't, I certainly do not have mastery of this. I have, uh, you know, every week I have a day where I go, man, I kind of blew it today. You know, I kind of, kind of got my nose down in whatever I was doing and, and forgot to look up and pay attention to a little girl who wanted me to see her little dress, you know, uh, and, or, or my you know, thir- now 13 year olds who had important, big life questions, right. They want to ask, but they're kind of shy. So you got to spend enough time with them to actually engage them. They're not just going to, you know, you can't just pop in for a 10 minute daddy session and be like, okay, I got 10 minutes. Tell me all your important questions. Uh, you really have to build that relationship with time. And some of that time can be working beside each other, but we still have to be aware and choose those moments. And so that's, you know, and I, I'm honestly, I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else. So don't, you know, don't sound, I'm not on a high horse here. I'm just trying to share because I think this is where we, or this is where we really uh, sometimes lose it as farmers is we don't, we forget these things. The reason we got into it in the first place, we forget, you know, to remember these things. So. So Curtis, you talk about the importance of, and you put it in terms of faith, of of remembering every day that what's important and prioritizing that. I mean, that's that's a really easy thing to say. I know that in the past, you and I've corresponded about uh, you know getting things done, David Allen's book, and and you know sort of systems for implementing the the values that that you want to live out in the world. Are there things that you've done? I mean, concrete structures that you put in place or things like that, that they help you remember to make the time. So there's actually, I mean, there's a number of, of things that have happened on the farm or choices I've made on the farm or, uh, or even daily routines that we have on the farm that support those. So, uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one is my day always goes better if I get up in the morning and have some quiet time. And for me, that means sitting down with a cup of tea and my Bible and praying and reading the Bible and, and just giving myself, myself time to meditate, think about the bigger picture. And, you know, if I do that, then I tend to walk into the day with the right, uh, the right mindset that, that kind of has, has, has those priorities in the right way. Right. And right. so that's a big deal. And it's hard because you get up and immediately the farm is right there in your face. You know, all the, all the undone paperwork on the desk is usually the first thing I see or the, uh, you know, 15 email messages that came in yesterday that I didn't have a chance to respond to because I was out in the evening doing something. Um, and so, and then also, you know, there's always, as a, as a father of a big family, there's always family stuff too. I mean, there's, you know, um, nine mornings out of 10, somebody in my family wakes up early and, you know, and then I've got (laughs) got some small person who wants to talk to me or have a story read or whatever. And those are good and noble things. But, but I do, I have to, I really try to block that time out. And uh, for me at least, and I know it's probably true for a lot of people that tends to work in waves. You know, I tend to have a month or two at a time where I'll be really good at that and really, really be devoted to that time. And then I'll kind of get out of the habit for a little while and then I'll, I'll pay for it because I'll be scattered uh, throughout my morning. So that's a big one to me is getting settled in the morning, meditating, thinking about what's important. Um, and, and to me, I mean, really, honestly, it's not just a, I mean, meditation implies, uh, there's a lot of different ways people think of that. For me, that means focusing on God, Christ. Uh, but it's that, it's that getting into the right mindset. Right. And so that's a big deal. 
um, on a more concrete maybe uh, end of things, we start each day with morning meeting with my family and my crew. And we used to not do that. We used to have just the crew or I would have breakfast with my family. We kind of, we kind of worked that back and forth for a while. Um, and eventually we just went to this thing where we're just going to have breakfast together every morning. And what has happened because of that is uh, my family has grown in a sense. So now my crew really is a part of my family. And um, I think we all view each other that way. And even people who come in for short-term experiences, woofers and interns and people, they walk away saying, you know, I really felt like I was part of the family there. And, uh, and so if we go, if we start our day as a family unit, then in, in some way, I feel like that kind of enforces that priority, right? It says, this is what matters. It matters that we're going to sit down and have breakfast with, you know, the, I've got it. So I've got a 13 year old girl, um, 12 year old, two 11s, uh, two 10s, uh, a seven, uh, five, uh, six and a, uh, four year old. And so, you know, we sit down all together. It's a busy table, right? But that's a good reminder that we're not here just to get our work done today. We're also here to interact with all the people around us, you know, whether they're volunteers on the farm or family members, they all have a place at that table and everybody gets to contribute and be a part of that. And then we move into morning meeting and that's when we really get organized for business and work. But, uh, but by making, blocking that time out in the morning to have a meal together, I think it does set a priority there as well. Um, you know, on the bigger picture, like structurally on the farm, uh, one of the things that's really helped us is, um, I'm a list maker. I love lists. I carry a clipboard all the time and I always have, um, it's actually the running joke around, you know, where's my clipboard? I'm always looking for a clipboard. I, <laughs> I have a habit of set, you know, like carrying it out to the, car, the, yes. the field and setting it down. And then, you know, two hours later, I cannot find it no matter where I look. I know where it is. It's you know, got to be here. Right. But, uh, but the, the clipboard is, is really, really key to me. And I have several of them. I have them organized anymore on a clipboard rack, which I love those things, steel clipboard racks. Um, you can put like eight clipboards in them and you can see the top of the clipboards. You can see which one you're looking for. But I have, you know, one that's for uh, the shop. I have one that's for the field. I have uh, one that is my office, uh, you know, office top. And then we've got special project clipboards. So if we're building a, a tractor shed, if we're uh, doing a renovation project or something, there'll be a clipboard that's devoted to that. And, you know, we've talked about uh, the, the getting things done system. And that's kind of, that was that idea. So it's capturing the idea as it comes into your head. And if you don't have a way to write it down, and, and I've tried, I've done some with my iPhone. I've, I've gotten more involved with that. I use reminders on my iPhone quite a bit just to capture those momentary thoughts. And it just frees up so much mental space. I found, I find on days when I don't have my phone or, or a notebook in my pocket, I get my brain gets cluttered with all these things that I'm seeing and no, noticing that need to happen. They're not something I can take care of today or right at this moment, but they need to get written down so that I get them taken care of eventually. And some of them are, uh, you know, I also, I'm pretty free with what I put on my list. I'll put stuff like build a swing set for the girls. You know, I, I it's not, I don't feel like I have to have this real sharp delineation between uh, my family life and my farm life. They, there's a big bleed between those two. Um, but I use that system to capture it. Um, now, where I tend to fall down is then translating that uh, into action, sorting and, and kind of acting those, you know, some of those notes sometimes will get lost for a while. That's, I guess, part of what I'm saying. But it still, it still helps to get that written down. And that's a big deal to me. Yeah. In the getting things done world, we'd call that processing. You know, it's, it's the, yeah. you know, the idea that you write it down, that's the capturing, but then it's kind of, that's always the the next step. And I think in, in some ways the capturing is, is always really appealing, but yeah, it's what do you do with the information once you have it on a piece of paper? And then how do you get that to pop back up in front of you in a time when you can actually deal with build a swing set for the girls? You bet. And, and, you know, one of the things that I do that way, um, and this is just, a, this is really, uh, you know, getting down to the details in, in my world, but is I, I rewrite my clipboard list pretty regularly. So I'll go through and I'll, I'll have, you know, maybe 10 pages on my clipboard on a, after a while, you know, a couple of weeks or maybe a month or so. I'll have several, a, a lot of pages. Some of those tasks will all be checked off. Some of them aren't. I prioritize them one, two, three. Uh, one to me is we really need to make sure this happens the next day or two. Uh, two is, hey, if we can get to it in a week or two, that's 
pretty good, right? Three can sometimes be really long-term stuff like build a tractor shed, you know, uh, get the, get the uh, pizza area, clear out some more trees in the back of the pizza area so we have a little more space to sit back there. You know, those things, those could be number threes. And, uh, and, those, and so I assign resources based on those priorities. And I really think, uh, for me at least, farming is 90% figuring out when to do things. You know, because uh, right. because we all most of us know what needs to happen. Uh, certainly, if we've done a little reading, done a little studying, spent some time on other farms, we kind of get it. We know what needs to happen, but we don't getting that ordered out in time. That's what's fascinating to me. I was trying to remember. I was thinking that. Um, oh, it seems like uh, Ben Hartman had a lot to say about that and and timing, and maybe J M Fortier as well. But both on the show, we're talking about the value of learning to prioritize your time. And, uh, and I, I've, atta- I, I agree wholeheartedly. That's been something that's just always seemed to me like the most important thing I can teach my managers, my interns, apprentices is how to sort this endless list of things that a farm and a family generates into priorities and then being able to act on them. So that's the processing part of GTD, right? So, yeah. um, and I kind of have a different, you know, a different version of it, but it's the same concept. It is, how do we take this list and make it into one, twos, and threes? And then part of my rewriting, which happens, you know, like I said, about every couple of weeks or about every month, is I really do to start with a totally clean piece of paper. Oftentimes it'll be a recycled piece of paper, so I'm writing on the back, but it's a clipboard and I'm transferring, going through my list of what's been done, what hasn't been done, and I'm putting it on. And I don't, at first I don't prioritize it, I just write it all out there, and then I go through and prioritize it again. And, uh, and that's how I don't, I mean, when that's working properly, and again, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes I'm doing really well at, sometimes I'm doing less well at, but when it's working really well, that's a good system for me. And eventually stuff that's threes ends up moving up to twos and eventually to ones, you know, and that's, that's very gratifying when you look back and see you know, a good example of that, uh, back in, oh, I think it was, uh, 2009, uh, not, we hadn't been here very long. In fact, it might've even been our first year. We had a woofer who came from uh, St. Louis, but he had been up in Wisconsin on a pizza farm up there. And he came and visited us and, and spent several weeks with us. We had a great time, really enjoyed meeting Dave and spending, spending uh, quite a while with him. He was so enthusiastic about these pizza, this pizza farm he'd been on. He was like, man, this is so great. You guys would love this, the way you guys are wired up to, for community and everything. You would really love this. And so it went on the list. You know, it was this list. It was like, build pizza oven. <laughs> uh, I think at the time I was trying to use that, like, you know, the month to month count, uh, folder system with, for GTD. Yep. Yep. And to get so, a particular you know, I put file. It back in like the next year list. Yeah. It was like the, the, like 2014 list or whatever. Right. And, uh, then shortly after that, I really settled into my clipboard listing process. And so it made it to the clipboard, made it to the long-term projects clipboard. I've got one of those and those are all threes, but they're things that I know, you know, eventually if this farm is going to keep moving forward, we want to do these things. And one of them that got on there was build a pizza oven. And it took like three years for us to get back to that, you know. Uh, finally, in fact, this was 2012, which ironically was that drought year where, you know, we, we scaled back dramatically. But because we did, suddenly we had just a little bit of slack time in our labor. And we were and we had a guy who was interning with us that year who had some masonry experience. And I was like, wow, this seems like the perfect alignment, right? I mean, I've got the time. I've got the guy who's got the experience. And I've got, I've had a little bit of time by then. I'd bought a book, kind of read up on it, had an idea of how it was going to work. And um, so the timing was right. And we put the pizza oven together in about four days. So it wasn't really that it took that much time, but it was that it took us, you know, three years to find the four days to do it. And then since then, we've built the second pizza oven, we built the shed over it. Um, and, you know, we started hosting these big pizza nights. It never would have happened if we hadn't captured that initial impulse that they've brought to the farm saying, Hey, what about pizza farm? So that kind of stuff, I, I really, I do. I think capture is so important. And even if that stuff sits on a clipboard somewhere for a couple of years before you actually get to act on it, it's still valuable. And then the other thing I love doing, and this is, this is where this is getting like a kind of nerdy, right? So, but I love looking back at old to-do lists that are checked off. Right. Oh yeah. And in fact, if I, yeah, if I do something that's not on my list, I'll go ahead and write it on there and check it off. Right. <laughs> Hey, you know, I did it, right? I should get credit for it. Even if it's only on my little piece of paper that's going to my file that I may never look at again, I want to make sure it makes it on the list. But, uh, but that's, that's, the, that's really the core of my getting things done system 
Um, some of the other stuff I've been more or less successful with, but that clipboard thing for me, that's my capture and process system. And it, it works pretty well. Curtis, thanks for, so much for sharing all that with us. I, I, what I'd like to do now is take a break and get a word from our sponsors. And then we're going to come back and dig into, well, I think the, the pizza club, uh, the Chinese greenhouse, and some more information just on how you're actually growing your crops. You bet. Sounds good. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible through the perennial support of BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it is truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. And by the perennial support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. Vermont Compost potting soils are a really special product. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew great transplants with it. And I mean really great transplants year after year, and we save time, money, and management hassles compared to mixing our own. At a time in the organic movement when we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the organic bandwagon, Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and the craft of making a truly great potting soil. One thing I have always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put out a consistent product year after year, and in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something that you can count on. VermontCompost.com And we're back with Curtis Millsap from Millsap Farms in Springfield, Missouri. So, Curtis, I wanted to ask about, I mean, I I knew going in that we were going to talk about pizza, but I was curious to hear you refer to it as Pizza Club. Aha, yeah, Pizza Club. So, (laughs) well, that is one of those uh, things that you end up naming because people tell you to name it that. And in my case, what it was, was uh, we have uh, an, an understanding with the health department. They call us a private party. And so as a result, we get, uh, we, we basically are uninspected because we are a private party. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with uh, planning and zoning guys who wanted to, uh, wanted to talk to me about events I was hosting. And I said, Oh, events. Um, okay. And uh, fortunately uh, one of the guys who's up there is, is uh, you know, kind of understands what we're about out here. And he said, now Curtis, what it looks like here is that, you really set out for these events to be attended by your membership, right? I said, yes, yes, that's right. That's, that's what I meant. <laughs> and he said, all right, so, uh, you know, if your website said was clear that it's all for members, then I think we'd have no problem. I said, sir, it will say that in 20 minutes. I promise you. <laughs> and, and that's been the last we've had to hear from the county. So, so what our pizza club, uh, the way it works is when you come in, you sign up. And, of course, people sign up in advance, but they get, we get their name and email um, and they become a member of the pizza club when they do that. And they, they pay for their first admission to the pizza club. Uh, and so we use that terminology and, you know, whether or not that will, uh, keep us, uh, on the, on, uh, keep the health department happy in the long term, we'll have to see, but right now it works for them and it works for us. And so that's kind of that, that actually is the origin of that. And it also reflects, I feel like it does in some ways reflects more accurately what we're about. This is not just a restaurant. This is very much a community event with, uh, I mean, we have like uh, about, it's, it's a pretty high percentage. I'm not sure what the actual percentage is week to week, but certainly uh, a, a super majority of folks who are returning uh, pizza club folks. And so, and some of them will buy, the moment we open up ticket sales in the spring, they'll buy all the tickets for the whole season for their family. So they'll come out every Thursday night and it's, that's, their, that's their night out. So, uh, so people yeah, are why. buying a people buy a ticket to the to your pizza night, and then that gets them their pizza. Or are they paying for the pizzas in addition to that? No, it's a it's a buy. You're buying an entry uh, for twelve bucks, and then it's all you can eat pizza. So yeah, 
And the reason we do that, um, we actually have, we looked at a lot of other pizza farms and people do it differently. Most places have pizzas you order, right? And that's kind of a standard restaurant model. Uh, but, uh, if you saw our rolling line, you know, the people who are contributing, you'd understand we do not get um, consistent sized pizzas out of this this lineup. You know, I mean, I've got literally <laughs> I've got like seven year olds and I've got 70 year olds rolling pizzas side by side. And uh, sometimes my seven year old can do better than some of the you know much older and more experienced people. But but, you know, they, they're real erratic size wise. And so that was part of our decision was, well, we can't really sell pizzas by the pizza if some of our pizzas are going to be uh, 10 inches across and others are going to be 18 inches across, that's not very fair, you know? Um, And then the other thing was, it's really, we want it to be a mixer. We want it to be a social event. And what we see with this system is since nobody's got a pizza that's theirs, they don't like, unless you order like a gluten-free or some special thing. Otherwise you just come up to the, to the buffet table and you pick up as much pizza as you want. And, uh, and then you go back to the table. And a lot of times those tables get shared because there's only, for 250 people, I think we only have about a dozen tables now. So people bring their own chairs, they bring blankets, they, it's a you know, big kind of uh, this party. But uh, but people end up sharing tables with one another. So I also think it does get to the true essence of it. I don't, it's not just nomenclature. I really do feel like it reflects what's going on on the ground. Tell me a little bit more about where you're getting your ingredients for the pizza. How does it? How does that all integrate with your two-acre vegetable farm? Yeah. So, you know, pizza farm, I mean, pizza night... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry again. So pizza night, in addition to being a great community event, is a wonderful outlet for seconds produce. You know, the bell pepper with a spot or the uh, all the tomatoes. I mean, you know how many seconds tomatoes? I don't know. With the field grown tomatoes, it seems to me like oftentimes we're like 50% seconds. And uh, and used to be that, you know, we'd try and sell those in bulk or we'd try and do things with them. But it was hard to get them all utilized. And nowadays they all go in the pizza sauce, uh, the bell peppers. You know, if we got a we've got a bunch of bell peppers, a little bit of black spot or something, no problem. You cut that off, you slice them up, put them on pizza. Uh, so we use a lot of produce, and actually our Monday morning starts with a conversation at our at our morning breakfast meeting. Right, we're all sitting there, and one of the topics we cover on Monday morning is what are we going to put on pizza this week, uh, and and the the real question is what do we have a lot of that we would like to. Uh, have a little less of, you know, and, 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 and get rid of it in this way. And so it's really uh, wide ranging. My wife is a pizza magician. Um, Sarah, she just, she, she scours the internet. She experiments. She has just a lot of innovative and creative ideas. And, uh, and so she puts things together. Like, for example, uh, one of the perennial favorites is a BAT, a bacon arugula tomato. Uh, we also do things like uh, ratatouille pizza, you know, eggplant, bell peppers, onions, tomatoes. Uh, she has done um, fennel pizza. Um, she's oh, potatoes. That's one of the weirdest ones. We've done a blue potato pizza with a cream sauce. And uh, my my father in law, who also lives on the farm here with us, and he's the pizza cutter. He he calls those who to thunk it pizzas. <laughs> he just you know, <laughs> every week we have yeah, we got cheese pizza. We always have a cheese pizza. We usually have one that's, yeah, you know, it's sausage and onions or something that you would kind of expect. And then there'll be two hudafunkets. And uh, the hudafunkets might be peaches and gorgonzola, or they might be um, these, you know, other odd beets are, are one that she loves to put on pizzas. My wife's a beet fanatic. And so she puts, makes wonderful combinations with beets. And originally, the first year that we did this, uh, you know, I'd be like, oh, honey, are you sure that's? And, you know, I learned to keep my mouth shut, of course, but there was still that internal, like, <laughs> how's that going to work out? But they've, they're they always awesome, you know? And so finally I realized I got to stop doubting this, right? I mean, this is always good. I have got to stop thinking that some reason she's going to, like, fall off the wagon and make a bad pizza. But she hasn't done it yet, so. And and no no disrespect to Sarah, but have you ever had a bad pizza? Well, exactly, right? And And it's true. I mean, you get some mediocre pizzas every once in a while, but really, if somebody is thinking it through at all, they make good pizzas. So it's it's a wonderful combination. So so as far as the ingredients, you know, we do almost all the produce uh, comes from our farm. The only exceptions would be like if we have mushrooms or something like that. And we do we have got mushroom farms locally that we're able to buy a lot of mushrooms from. Um, the dairy is uh, we have some we have a goat cheese dairy that we get a lot of goat cheese from, but <clears throat> all our mozzarella is still coming from um, from Sam's. We would love it if we could come across, you know, a, a farm-based mozzarella solution. 
but we haven't come across that yet. Um, and then, uh, but all our tomato sauce we raise on the farm, we buy organic flour. You know, we're not really in a good uh, hard wheat raising region. It's it's a little too warm down here for good good hard wheat. So, uh, so we don't really have a local option on that. We do raise a lot of the corn that we use for cornmeal. Uh, we have an heirloom corn variety that we raise. It's a red corn, and we grind that for the cornmeal for the uh, skids. So you put the you know, roll out the dough and then set them on a skid with cornmeal under it. Uh, so yeah, we we do we locate a lot of the stuff here locally. Um, and uh and then we get really creative with it and that's that's been the the thing that people really remember when people come out uh because they just think it's intriguing to come out to the farm for pizza but they walk away remembering one that we had these incredibly creative pizzas and two that they just had this amazing experience on a farm and that's really what it always comes down to is that people say this and I, I really like this phrase people will say i just didn't know there were things like this anymore and what I realized after a while was they don't really mean like they can't, if they were going to try and pinpoint it, they don't really know quite what they mean by that. They can't point back and say, well, there must've been things like this in the forties. You know, it's not like that, but what they really mean is like, this is the way that I thought things were supposed to be. Like I thought I was supposed to be able to go and enjoy a meal with family and friends in a totally low key environment with wonderful food and delightful music and, a place where the kids can go and play and enjoy and I feel safe and on a beautiful location where we've got, you know, rows of flowers and vegetables and greenhouses and forests and lawns and things for them to hang out in and enjoy. That's really what they mean with all that. And to me, that's the most important thing about this whole thing of you know, excellent food. And then this, this uh, all encompassing experience. And uh, let me say too, I think that, you know, we, uh, we live in this culture where people are so disconnected from not even just the source of their food, but the countryside in general. I mean, creation, right? I mean, people, people live their whole lives getting in their cars and their garages and driving to work and getting out and going in the, in the building and come back out in their car and they go back in the house and, you know, they go sometimes for days without ever setting foot out in the yard, let alone actually getting out where there are trees and things growing and birds and such. Um, and if they do go out on the lawn, it's to mow it, you know, it's just, I mean, granted grass has to get mowed if you're going to keep it short, but, but the, when they come out here and they connect to the bigger sky and the, the trees full of stuff and a little bit of wildness back there in the woods, you know, I mean, I tell people don't go too far back in there. There's poison ivy, right? I mean, that's what all that stuff knee high, like as far as you can see, that's poison ivy. Don't go where we don't mow. But but you can look out there and you can see so much going on. I think that really uh, is something that people are craving. And so that's part of the experience that we're providing here too, is that connection. And then also, of course, the connection to the amazing thing of taking a seed, putting it in the soil, and then it actually turning into a full-size plant. That, that's something that people don't do anymore, which is amazing to me. I mean, I grew up gardening. I, I've done it you know, as long as I can think. But I meet a lot of people who really have never planted a seed. And I, I think that's really, if we can do something in this world, it's to get people to connect with that. And, and from my perspective, what that's about is when you get connected to that, when you get connected to the land and the soil, uh, it's, it's creation. You, got, you can't be out there for very long before you start thinking much bigger thoughts than the thoughts you were thinking when you started. You know, you, you come at it with the thoughts about all the long list of things you have to do and all this stuff. And uh, I think most of the time when you're out there in the field long enough or you're in the soil long enough, you start to think about, what is this all about? What's going on in the big picture? And to me, that leads us to the really important things in life. You know, it makes us step back a little bit and look at the look at the universe, the creation around us and all that from just eating pizza, you know? So it's a pretty good gig. <laughs> <laughs> and so this whole project started in, you said in 2012, when you had a little bit of extra time because of the drought. Can you yep. tell us how pizza club developed from there so uh, in 2012 we had that little like, bit of extra help to get the pizza oven built and so uh, immediately as soon as we you know 10 days after we built it it was dry enough to fire up and try pizzas and we were like wow this is really good i wish we'd done this four years ago uh but we were you know we weren't really ready and I, honestly i'm like a jump in the deep end of the pool kind of guy and my wife, Sarah, is to some degree, too. I mean, we do have 10 kids, you know, so obviously we're deep into the pool kind of folks. But 
she was not really ready to like put herself out there commercially as a pizza chef. Right. So I was kind of ready to try and sell some tickets. And she was like, no, let's just practice on friends and family. And that worked really well. So we, uh, we took about, this was about six months or so where we did, we hosted a lot of family birthday parties, friends, birthday parties. Um, but we didn't do anything for pay. We just did a lot of fun times with family and friends. And really, in hindsight, I think that was great. I mean, my wife is wise beyond her years. So, so she really did see that and, and, and understood how that was going to work out. And then by spring of 2013, we were ready to try, kind of get our feet wet in, in doing it a little bit for, for profit. And so we didn't really know quite what that was going to look like. We hadn't tracked our expenses closely enough or, or you know, really thought through a lot of the logistics of it. But we started saying, well, we'll just, we'll kind of advertise through our CSA we're having a pizza night this week. You know, if you want to come out, I think our first pizza night in 2013, uh, that was a commercial pizza night. I think we had like 30 people, you know, so it wasn't a big deal. And frankly, it was also one of those things where we're like, well, that was a lot of work for 30 people. <laughs> we're gonna, we're not going to do that. I mean, if that's, if that's as big as we're going to get, that's not going to work in the long term. but it was fun. And, um, that summer it grew gradually. I think, um, by the end of the summer, we were running about a hundred 150 people regularly, and that was when we realized we needed a second oven uh, to keep up with demand. And by that time, we had built the pavilion. It's just a long, uh, simple pole barn shed over the top of the ovens. And uh, we had started to kind of sort out different equipment for our rolling tables and such. Pretty pretty simple stuff, but stainless steel tables, things like that, that we had located. And uh, and we had set up our lights, so we had kind of an evening venue. And... Uh, and at the end of that year, end of that summer, we started having music. And that really was a game changer. Uh, I can't overestimate or over, over exaggerate what a great thing having live music at an event is. It changes it from just being kind of a casual gathering of a few people who might have a conversation with one another to it being a party. And I'm not talking about, you know, obviously not a big raucous, you know, uh, kegger or something. I'm talking about a really a celebration, an enjoyment of one another. You got music, you got good food, you've got uh, it's a BYOB event. Uh, we don't sell the only drinks we sell are soft drinks and things, but we do allow people to bring in beer and wine and alcohol. And uh, so we that was a turning point for us, the end of 2013. Uh, by the beginning of 2014, we were filling up regularly, selling out about 200 uh, seats or 200 people, and that's actually adults. So when I say 200 adults, we're bringing in probably another 50 or 60 kids regularly. So Really, on uh, average Thursday nights now, we're running about 250 adults, which is probably more like 300 with kids, and we're charging $12 a head for adults, uh, all-you-can-eat pizza, and $5 for kids. And we don't actually have people pay in advance. We have them reserve in advance, and we cut off when we meet, re reach our 250 people. And so we're usually selling out now about a week and a half, two weeks in advance, sometimes as much as a month, depending on the... You know, as we get closer to the end of the season, people try try and cram in, make sure they make it to the last few. So, uh, but it's really grown. One thing, you know, that I think if anybody's thinking about doing this, you really have to figure out where's your labor going to come from. In our case, uh, we have our, of course, our on-farm help, and they're a big part of this. Um, they, they're just key to making it all happen. Cami is is uh, she is the prep master. She gets down there and preps all the surfaces, all the uh, all the uh, pans washes and cleans and stacks and sorts and then uh, divides out the dough my do my two daughters my two uh, oldest daughters uh, make the dough and they make buckets of dough in advance we put them in the walk-in cooler so they can sit there for 24 hours or if we don't use them because of the weather uh, changes and we can't have an event we'll go ahead and save them for the next week so that's a that's a real uh, big deal and then we also um, my wife spends most of the day most of thursday prepping the, the final toppings, you know, and, and she has a lot of help with that, but some of those help, you know, some of that help is six year old, six years old and wants to wield a knife. So sometimes the help's more or less helpful, uh, <laughs> but, they, but they all, you know, they all want to contribute. And that's a big part of how we've kind of made this thing work, you know, it's by tying the family back in at those kind of moments. And then once we are on, once we're actually set up for pizza night, we do, we serve, start serving at six. So we really start prep about four thirty on site. And at that point, it's all hands on deck. Everybody on farm is down there prepping, making sure that uh, everything is ready when the first people walk in at 515, 530. People, I mean, people actually come and stake out seats 45 minutes in advance 
because there's only 12 tables, you know. And so they want to make sure and reserve their table. And uh, so they'll come in, you know, by that time, we're ready. Uh, one that aspect that we really didn't think about in advance uh, before the first couple of big events was parking. And uh, that's, you know, we got to, you got to think about that. It's a lot of cars uh, to get into a space and you got to make sure that they're all going to be directed well. So we've got a guy, uh, one of our, one of the guys who works on farm with us regularly, his son comes and directs traffic and does a great job with it. Uh, so, you know, and we just have all those little pieces that have kind of come into place over time, but uh, it is, it's a really good event and it's a good event for the farm, both uh, in terms of community interaction and also bottom line, frankly. I mean, it's a, it, it helps us make the bills meet. Uh, last year, I think pizza sales were about uh, $70,000. That's a pretty significant portion of our income. And, um, and the, the net on that is, it's actually a little hard to know that we've been doing a lot of investing in, in simple infrastructure stuff, but you know, something around uh, the net return on that is about 30 to 40%, maybe a little more uh, of actual, um, you know, after we've paid for expenses, that doesn't necessarily cover labor. But the uh, but the expenses of putting on the event. So. Always hard to account for labor when you're when you've got six year olds cutting up peppers. You know, <laughs> you know. Actually, Department of Labor gets a little touchy about that. You start putting them on the uh, on the on the timesheets, and they start to think this is a problem. So, yeah, yeah. But they they love to be part of it. You know. I also wanted to circle back about something you'd mentioned at the beginning of the show. You said you've got. In addition to all your high tunnels and regular greenhouses, you guys have a what you call a Chinese greenhouse. Yeah. So, you know, we started covering space right away. In fact, we bought this place because it had a 6,000 square foot greenhouse on it. That was the initial attraction to the farm. And it was, it's a 40 year old big structural greenhouse. And so right away we recognized there are huge advantages to covering your growing space. And, you know, we talked about some of the challenges of carving the Ozarks, but I mean, the the first year that I covered my greenhouse out there, um, I covered it in October, January, we had a freak thunderstorm. It was like 70 degrees and it dropped literally baseball sized hail on my greenhouse plastic. And, uh, you know, it was devastating. It uh, definitely was one of those chances to practice your faith. You know, you can, you can either at that point, you can either curse God or you can go, okay, well, God gave, God took away and blessed is God. And so that was my response. But, but then you know, still, I looked at that and went, wow, if that, you know, if that happened in the summertime, that would totally wipe out your crop. I mean, you'd be looking at nothing. Whereas, you know, in the greenhouse, although we had damage to the greenhouse itself, the the plants inside were safe, you know. So we right away were looking at ways to get some control over our environment, ways to to build roofs over things. So we've done a lot over that over the years with that, with high tunnels and so on. But the the Chinese greenhouse in particular was a model we saw. Um, San Jun Gu, who used to be the uh, the horticulture specialist for the state of Missouri, Lincoln University, actually, um, he was he's from China and he had worked in these greenhouses over there and he gave a presentation at Great Plains uh growers conference, which by the way, that's a great conference. Anybody who's looking for a conference. Um we went to Great Plains and saw him present about these he was calling them Chinese earth tunnels. I've heard him called a lot of different things, but the basic premise is you've got your north wall is a a some sort of structure. It's either masonry or in China oftentimes it's even just packed soil that's been cut back with a backhoe or something. But it's a it's a big earthen wall on the north side with a berm, and so that berm goes all the way to the top of your greenhouse. And then the, there's a little short north roof, and in my case it's about four feet wide. And then it draw you know the rest of it is a south facing glazing slope. It's double plastic over metal hoops, pretty typical uh, high tunnel greenhouse structure. And then it's got north, uh, east and west ends are also concrete blocks with earth berm. So what I ended up using for my structure is these big what they call concrete. Um, waste blocks and they're what what happens to the ready mix concrete that goes back to the plant they dump it in these forms and uh, and then when it sets up they you know they pull it out and they sell it and they sell it for a fraction of what it would cost you to buy concrete so these were a good resource right. for us we kind of we struggled with that for a while figuring out how we're going to hold the soil back and um, as we are in a we're in a zoned county so we had to build something that that met their standards so we, we got it engineered. We had this looked at by uh, a structural engineer, and he stamped it. And then we started stacking up blocks in this kind of L, you know, U shape. We dug out the interior. We put that soil on the back. And so the whole thing's set in the ground about two feet. And uh, and then it's got you know all this massive structure around it. So uh, our overall structure is 22, uh, sorry, 24 feet deep 
by 72 feet long. The only thing I would do differently if I could build it again would be to build it longer because it really, it's a, it's a great structure and I wish I had more space in it. But in that space, uh, we've got almost a hundred and see, what was it? It was 3000 pound blocks and we had a hundred of them. So it's almost 300,000 pounds of concrete. And, um, and that's a that's a lot of mass right there. And then you got that backed up by all that soil that's banked against those walls as well. So what you've got is this huge thermal flywheel. And um, you know I've seen other models that people have built that are not that are they'll, they'll call them kind of Chinese greenhouses. But one of the things we really wanted to do when we when we went to build ours was just build it as true as possible to what we could find on uh, in Chinese websites and photos and things like that. Um, I don't speak Chinese. It was rather difficult sometimes to discern exactly what we were looking at because, you know, it was almost always the text was always always in Chinese. But uh, we got a pretty good idea, and the, and the, the commonalities were the thermal mass walls, uh, south facing slope, always dug into the ground a couple feet, um, and then this the north little north roof. And so I had looked at other things that people had built in the states or in Canada, and and none of them quite worked to just stay true to that model. And my thought was, and I've looked in the numbers and now it's kind of slipped my mind because numbers sometimes do, but I mean, it's, it's thousands and thousands of acres that are covered by these in China. They're growing the majority of their winter vegetables in these kind of structures. Um, and when Dr. Gu presented about this, he was showing pictures of himself standing in a Chinese greenhouse uh, beside mature cucumbers and watermelons in February. And he's saying, you know, this is no supplemental heat. This is a climate very similar to what we're experiencing here in the Midwest. Um, he said maybe a little less wind. That was the big difference. But in terms of temperatures, highs and lows, it was very, very similar. And uh, and I was hooked. You know, I said this is this is brilliant. So so that's how we got started. And then once we built it, you know, there's been a learning curve. Obviously, um, it's a it's a little bit of a difficult structure to ventilate because you don't have that second wall to open up. Just got we got one drop curtain wall on the south side. Um, it's been a little challenging to figure out with drainage. It's two feet below the ground level. So uh, we've had a few floods in there. We now have a big sump pump in there and that keeps it drained out uh, as long as the power doesn't go out. Um, and we've also struggled with grow media. You know, we tried originally some grow bags in there, uh, long grow socks actually. And I love the concept. I really did. But the first time our media was really high, uh, high, um, pH, it would turn out to be like a 7.7 seven or even an 8.1 or something. It was really uh, way too high for vegetables. And uh, so that we didn't know that. We bought it as compost, thinking it was growing compost. And there was a miscommunication. The guys thought we were just using it for uh, erosion control. So it's important that people know what you're doing with your soil. Um, and then they, they very graciously replaced it with a better compost. But even then, we struggled with those socks. For us, it seemed like in the wintertime, they have so much evapotranspiration. Tra- is that the right word? Yeah, I think so. You know, cooling off as the water exits those socks, that the soil temperatures always stayed pretty cool, and um, and it was also hard to keep them wet enough. Um, so so we eventually got rid of the socks and went to just uh, raised beds, and they were just used oak one by twelves to to build these raised beds and fill them with compost and some soil and kind of you know a, a little bit of everything, but mostly compost. And, and we've had no problems since then, really, with our grow media. It's, it's worked really well. We have used those grow socks in other settings and had better luck with them. So I think there's something about the combination of that structure and these grow socks that was kind of a bad combination. Never really quite sorted out what was going on there. But but the, but the Chinese structure in general, it is the most temperature-stable structure on the farm. Uh, last weekend when we got down to negative one, I got up. Uh, a couple times in the night. I, one night I did the fire feeding. One night Kimby, my farm manager, did it. But you know we were trips across the, the, the farm to feed the fire in the big greenhouse to keep it above freezing. We've got some fig trees and some uh, other things in there that we didn't want to let freeze yet. In the Chinese greenhouse, I didn't even worry about it. I mean, I just I know that it's going to be okay. We got a slight frost which nipped our turmeric. Uh, we have a bunch of turmeric still growing in there. Well, not growing now because it's nipped, but it was until last weekend. And um, and it's it just holds its temperature so well. It's amazing. Uh, we've had the lowest temperatures that I've dealt with with it were uh, negative 13. We had a cold snap about two years ago where it stayed in the in the you know zero and below zero every night and and quite a bit below freezing every day for uh, about a week. 
And even in that long cold snap, we still only saw frost in the in the Chinese greenhouse of about maybe 25 or so. So, you know, we still got head lettuce, carrots, uh, radishes, turnips, beets, anything you'd want to grow that's you know, a cool weather crop. You can still pull off marvelously in this space. So it's, it's been a good space for us. What kind of media are you using in those raised beds now? We have, uh, for, for media, we've gone back and forth. Originally, we had all that compost that was in the socks. And so we did cut some of those socks open and, and amend it. Um, we felt like we still were having some pH problems. So we, we did add some sulfur to that to bring it back up and bring the pH down a little bit. And then uh, the bigger thing that I think happened was just that compost matured. I really think that was the main problem was the compost was still fairly hot. And I think, you know, you just can't grow good produce in hot compost. It's, it's very hard. Um, but since then, uh, we have mixed some soil in. At times, we've had access to uh, some topsoil, either from, uh, you know, renovation projects around the farm, or uh, we've also done a lot of wood chips in the bottom of the beds. So uh, we have uh, chipper crews who bring out a lot of wood chip uh, piles to us. And so we always have, uh, you know, several hundred yards of wood chips sitting around. And, and ideally, we let them sit for a couple of years. And then we found if they've sat for a couple of years and mostly decomposed, they'll still be chippy. But if you put that in the bottom six or eight inches of your of your foot tall raised beds and then top that with a nice layer of compost on top, it really makes a nice growth media. Um, and then over time, you know, you can't even tell they're ever wood chips. Of course, it's, it turns into this beautiful humus down down deep. And so, uh, so we're able to grow carrots in that. And that, that kind of is my gold standard as far as are we doing well with what our soil is doing is uh, – can we grow nice, long, straight carrots? Because you know we don't, uh, it's not just rocks, but there's so many things that come into play in that. But um, we, we do some really nice stuff in those these days. Compost, wood chips, soil, uh, native soil uh, have been the main ingredients for us. All right. So we're going to take a quick break, get another word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with the lightning round with Curtis Millsap. This week's lightning round is brought to you by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time and increasing the number of buyers your farm can work with overall. Use the software to inform your buyers about your farm, your product availability, delivery days, pickup locations, and more. With Farmers Web, your customers can place their orders online, or you can enter them for buyers who place their orders by text, phone, or email. You can define payment terms for different buyers, give select buyers special pricing, and generate pick lists, packing slips, and product catalogs for your customers. You can keep track of payments that you receive by check or COD, or buyer payments by credit card can go right into your bank account. Farmers Web can even help you coordinate deliveries with neighboring farms. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types from month to month at any time, even during the off-season. FarmersWeb.com All right, Curtis, you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. All right. What's your favorite tool on the farm? Okay. So this is, I, I have to say, I, I really struggle with this one. The obvious answer, and it's such a cop-out, is my tractor. I love tractors. I hear about market gardeners who would just use a BCS, and we have a BCS as well. And we love it. But man, I love getting on that tractor. And it's just a little thing. We've got a little 28 horsepower Ford with a front loader. But that front loader is brilliant. You know, I mean, it's like having an eight-person crew just ready to help you anytime you need help. And so I love it. And people who, who farm without a tractor, I have the greatest admiration for that, but I really love it. But the other one that, that ties, and it, it, that kind of ties into the community thing as well, but the one that really does in terms of quality of life stuff has been, for me, has been the biodegradable black plastic. Uh, we used bio, the non-biodegradable stuff for a while. And um, we just found that it was... Uh, we never got it out of the fields. We always had black flags flying out in the field, you know, after we'd pulled it out. And so we really got put out with that. And then when the biodegradable stuff came along and, and I know there's a lot of kind of controversy around that and I, I wouldn't belittle that, but it is such a huge labor saver to go out and lay black plastic, plant your head lettuces into it. And the next thing you do is harvest those head lettuces. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I, to me, that really speaks to quality of life stuff. Because when you find a product that can reduce your time doing what's really menial, I mean, I don't think weeding the head lettuce is anybody's favorite job on the farm, you know? And when you can get rid of something like that, um, then to me, that's, that's a really powerful tool. So that's, that's really probably it is our, our, our black plastic mulch. And we've, we've learned a lot of different ways to work with that and, and things like that. But the, just the base product is such a useful tool for us. And your favorite crop to grow? Carrots. 
I love carrots. I love the magic of pulling a long orange, beautiful, sweet, tasty root out of the ground. <laughs> I think it's amazing. Every time it does, it makes me smile every time we dig carrots. Um, and they're not easy to grow in our soils necessarily. We don't have real bad soils, um, surprisingly, being in the Ozarks. We're typically really rocky around here, but our, our soils are not too rocky right on our little spot. And so, so we have decent carrot soils, but I've really enjoyed learning to grow them better. Um, I mean, and, and to give you an idea of how far we've come on this, when we were doing that seven acres back in the, in the day, there literally were at least once or twice when I had to brush hog down the bed to be able to see if there were carrots to dig under there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh man. I mean, that's a bad day, right? When you're like, let's get the brush hog out, see if there's any carrots under that. Uh, you, you do not want to have to have to do that. And, uh, well, so, it, it gives you room for improvement, right? Well, you know, there was a lot of room for improvement in those <laughs> early years, but, but learning to do, uh, do pre pre emergence weeding with flame weeding, um, even pre plant weeding with black plastic tarps. We've done a lot of that sort of thing. Um, that's JM Fortier. You know, that was a great uh, kind of thing that he that he has really made more popular. Um, but figuring out how to weed your soil, and of course the the Nordells have been talking about weeding your soil and not the crop for years. But that is such a that's a, such a key concept. And with carrots, there's such a big payoff. You know, nobody likes weeding carrots. They're horrible to weed. But you uh, you get them out there uh, into a weed-free bed, and you see this beautiful row of carrot seedlings come up. It, to me, it's gratifying from there right on into the stew pot. I just, I love carrots. So that's that's my favorite. What's the best advice you've ever gotten? You know, I think the best advice came from my dad. Um, he was a vice principal um, at a middle school for many years. And my dad said, treat people the way you want them to be, not the way they are. And what he meant by that, for the most part, was if you go around reacting to the way people are, then you'll pretty much perpetuate them being that way. You know, if you expect a bad kid to be bad and you go into it ready for that or you treat them, uh, you know, in, in a kind of demeaning way because, because you know they're going to misbehave or whatever, then you're just going to get more of what you expect. But when you expect great things from people, um, then they tend to step up and, and provide it. Um, obviously, it's no magic formula here, but there is a difference in attitude when you go and look at people and say, this is who I think you can be. And this isn't some sort of like, you know, make them improve themselves. This isn't about manipulating them, but it's just about you're in your own head thinking, I know this person can be an amazing wonderful person to spend time with, a, a, an incredible worker or whatever. And if you start with that, um, then I think you're a lot more likely to get there. Now, obviously, we've also had plenty of people who, you know, moved on from the farm that that, that didn't, you know, attitude wasn't all that was wrong with what was going on in their heads. So sometimes, you know, sometimes the best thing you can do for those kind of workers is let them go. But, but starting with that attitude, that I'm going to treat you the way that I know you can be, you know, I'm going to treat you toward your potential rather than, um, rather than treat them with whether what they're currently performing at. That's probably the best advice I ever got. And that was, that was my dad. He's great at good advice. <laughs> and then how about you on the advice front? If you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Well, if I, I would tell myself to intern first off, I think that would have been really powerful. And I, I didn't get a chance to do that. It would have been hard. I had a new baby on the way. I had an adopted son who was uh, 14 when he moved here to Springfield and started farming. So that, that would have been really challenging. I know that. But that's what I tell everybody who comes in and wants to know about learning to farm. I say, man, find a way to intern. Somehow, find a way to get on a farm that's doing what you want. And I think, you know, key element of that is find a farm that is doing what you want. Not just growing the things you want or, you know, or, or selling the way you want, but like the big picture. Do they have the quality of life? I think of like, uh, oh, Paul Arnold is a great example, you know, of a guy who, I mean, when I, when I read about his farm, when I read about his life, the guy has done, he, he walks the talk, right? So find somebody who does that and attach yourself to him for a year or two. It, surely there's no better way to do that. So that would have been my advice. Now, I didn't take it. The second bit of advice, you know, knowing that I wouldn't take my own advice would have been, well, for goodness sake, don't get bigger than two acres. You know, there's no reason. Um, and that's not universal advice. That's just to me specifically, because that turns out to be 
kind of my sweet spot is managing two acres. And so uh, I would love to be able to tell myself that in the first place and save myself three years of messing around with bigger and bigger and, you know, and kind of really messing around and screwing things up. Curtis, thank you so much for a really insightful and informative hour and a half here on the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for what you're doing. I tell you, I mean, I've, I fell behind this summer, which was a big bummer. <laughs> I've, I've missed about 20 episodes. And I'm going to catch up on this winter. But I never fail to learn something from a Farmer to Farmer podcast. And certainly a lot of that is the guests who bring wonderful expertise and knowledge. But a lot of it is you're, you, you do a great job of interviewing people. And I really appreciate that. I want to tell you thank you for that. So thank you for having me. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 101 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Curtis. That's C U R T I S. Transcripts for this episode are brought to you by Growing for Market. Get 20% off your subscription with the code podcast at checkout. And by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. EarthTools.com. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmer to farmer podcast.com. Also, if you like the show, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review, or talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. I really couldn't do this show without them. You can support the show by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com. I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs> <laughs>